One of the first physical signs of a VISI, which is volar intercalated segmental instability, is actually a dropping of the wrist a little bit volar uh, in comparison to the radius. And we have our patients check that by asking them to place their hands in a, a kind of a relaxed, low position with uh, fingers and hands in a line with the forearm. And we look to see which hand has a greater drop of that proximal row in comparison to the radius. And here, indeed, you can see that the right hand on this side, which is our subject's actual um, affected side, where she has a little bit of discomfort, her hand on this side is a little bit lower. It's dropped. So we can confirm that with a little bit of joint play testing. What I'll do is I'll step inside my patient's arm, and I will stabilize the radius with a relaxed wrist. I'll take the triquetrum, which is the bone that's just distal of the radius, and I'll simply move it up and down about five to six times and give an overpressure up and an overpressure down, and I'll compare that with what I think is the more lax side. So then I'll step inside again, and I will, with a relaxed forearm, stabilize the ulna, grasp the triquetrum, which is the next bone towards the fingers, and again, I will make an excursion of volar and dorsal, and indeed on this side, you can see that the volar excursion is quite significant. So I'll do that a few times, and then I can give overpressure up and overpressure down again. Now, when you have a volar laxity on the ulnar side of the hand, it can be accompanied and actually perpetuated by stiffness in the radial column. Because as we talked about, the first sign of laxity in this visi uh, condition of the hand is often due to uh, repeated loads with the wrist and extension. Repeated loads with the wrist and extension puts a tremendous amount of force through the radial column of the hand and sometimes leads to st early stiffness in that column. So we'll check our patient's range of motion compared to the other side with another simple test. We'll have our patient put her hands together and then drop the hands below the elbows. And basically what we're looking for is a, the angle that occurs between the right and the left side. Now, in this instance, we definitely see that we have a greater angle on the left side, the right side is showing to be a little bit stiff. To check flexion in comparison to the other side, we put the backs of the hands together, again drop the elbows, and again you can look at this angle hand to forearm. Um, here it, on the right side it's less, indicating a loss of motion in both flexion and extension, which is a mild capsular pattern of the wrist, usually coming from stiffness in the radial column. Before I show you the techniques for how to mobilize that stiffness, I'll give you one more uh, uh, clinical phenomenon that you might see and you can also test for. But sometimes when you have a, a volar laxity and the, the, the hand has dropped in comparison to the radius, you will see actually sometimes increased flexion range of motion in the wrist and a loss of extension. So to repeat, in this case, we have a both a loss of flexion and extension. That's about equal. But in other cases, you may see hyperflexion compared to the other side and hypo extension compared to the other side. When that's the case, what you'll want to do is take the little finger of your, of your distal hand, place it on the proximal row 
of the carpal bone, stabilizing the, the radius, and basically lift the proximal row in line with the radius, and then repeat your extension motion, and often it is fully, uh, full range of motion. So in that case, it's an indication of a mal-centered position of the proximal row in relation to the radius, and in those cases, you do not normally need to mobilize.